were blessed repeatedly by being asked, invited, and brought into the communion of the Holy Spirit, the communion of Christ. And it gives us a physical reference point and a spiritual reference point. It leads us to greater understanding. It leads us to greater awareness. I am so glad that we have what we have here in our little family. I'm happy that we have all the blessings we do. And I do want to say on behalf of Bill and I both, it was weird both of us having the same week. Who could ever imagine? But in God's glory and in his greatness, he made everything come out the way it needed to. And I'm grateful for that. Well, over the last many weeks, we've talked about worship, looking at it from above, from below, from behind, in front of, from the left, from the right. And it comes down to one idea. What is worship? What is worship of God? And that answer is, it is a living sacrifice to God. You know, in the Bible, we see examples of many things. But in Romans 12, Paul puts together a thought. And I'm going to read this from the New Living Testament. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he does for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Truly, this is the way to worship him. But don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Notice that process. Don't be like those in the world. Don't follow those customs. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And after the way you think is altered and you see the new and true reality, you have different motive, different reasoning. You have different ideas. You have different understanding of being a person. It is then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing, and perfect. Now, when we worship God, we understand we're worshiping, and we're aiming that to God, toward God, for God. But what else is worship for? What else is it about? We go on reading in Romans 12, verse 3, and this shows us where else worship is aimed. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, says Paul, I give each of you this warning. And understand, this is for us, for you guys too. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Who are yourselves? More than just me, or more than just one of you, or one of them, the others. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong. We all belong to who? Each other. Each other. We know we are bought with the price. We know we are Christ's. We are God's. We are the Holy Spirit's. But the point here is Paul is expanding the thinking, and he's including each other. Now, that puts it in a familial realm. 
Being a living sacrifice to God and living within the body where there are many parts of the one body and we belong to each other, how do we practice worship belonging to each other? In one situation, someone might go and say, hey, I'm available, I can give you a ride. Someone else might say, we need a visit here, I'll go visit. Someone else might say, well, I can help with that, I can cook this meal or do that. The point is, it is inclusive of someone else. Now, I want you to think of your Christianity in your life in this term I'm going to give you now. It does no good to go into the middle of the desert, 600 miles from any city, any road, any person, and be by yourself. What good is enlightenment if it only enlightens you? What good is your life enlightened if it is only seen by you? We're not made to be an island in the middle of a desert, not to be seen by others. Remember, we're in the family of God, adopted into the sonship that Jesus brought us into. So in worshiping and in giving our worship experience for others to both participate in and see, I'll ask a rhetorical question. Are you aware of any obvious worship experiences that aren't called worship? but they involve others, and they are worshiping God. I visited with a lady this week, and she has come through a very, very trying time. Her family was near destroyed. And now that things are back on track, and everything that she is touching is turning back to God, the marriage up, and we talked about it. And she needed a reference point, and that reference point was this. Even in our marriages, even in our having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, or even a best friend, even in those things, how we conduct that relationship and live within that marriage is true worship when we do it appropriately and correctly. Marriage, something so simple. When it sets an example that puts the marriage above everything else, and someone looks and says, look at that couple there. Look at how they care for each other and nurture each other. Look how they respect each other and they function as one. And that example sits above everyone. Isn't that kind of like Jesus and his example of life he gave? His life was above the normal plane of function for most people. Now, rhetorically again, what else in our lives, in our experiences, is that high level of worship? to be seen and experienced and felt. How we treat, how we raise, how we care for and nurture our children or those children given to us to be guardians over. How we interact with those children, those youngsters, is another level of worship that is profoundly above the average when done right. When led by the Spirit, parenting can set incredibly significant examples. You know, we think of the children coming from Africa that are without parents. And we think of the kids that are homeless now in today's society. 
But there is something to be said in those children for their determination and their ability to even go on despite what has happened to them. We got to sit down and visit with one of our pseudo foster kids yesterday for several hours. And I was reminded of what he was like when he came to us. An arm in the cast with a big cigar burn in the back of his hand, his arm having been broken by his dad with a baseball bat because he didn't obey. I sit and think of where Michael is now, and I found myself for a moment wondering, why is he here, really? Why is he wanting to come and spend time with us? And it came down to one thing, the interaction, the care, the nurturing, the motives being true and pure, and I'm sitting there, and I suddenly realize, wow, this is worshiping God at a level that transforms people who see it and experience it. Experiencing it especially is impactful. Now, as we worship in our families with cousins and aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters, can we think off the top of our head about anybody that doesn't know how to worship through raising their kids, through honoring the gifts that children are? Sure, we can, we can realize there's some people that don't have the ability to do that. And it doesn't matter whether they were not taught it, didn't learn it. What matters is that if we know that worship, what matters is if we don't do, set an example, show, and if asked, set a living example that they can learn from that all points back to the plan, the Savior, and the Holy Spirit. If we don't do that in that moment, we're not fulfilling the worship that has been put upon our shoulders. So let's go a step farther. Have you ever found yourself in a moment when you're sitting alone reading, maybe even watching TV, and you kind of slide off into a, a daydream thought? You slide off into a brief mental awareness of something not related to the TV, maybe even the book you're reading, and suddenly you realize, why am I thinking about that? This isn't good, much less it isn't godly. It's not appropriate. How did I get here? We see that happening all around us in the world. And each person's reality is unique to them. But it shouldn't be forced upon everyone else. The point I want to make about that is this. When we find ourselves isolated off by ourselves mentally, not being led by and not being focused on godly things, it puts our mind in a coasting neutral state. And when our mind is in a coasting neutral state, what can go wrong with a car? If you're going up a hill and you're in neutral, you might quit and roll backwards. If you're going down a hill and there's a curve, you might have a crash. The point is we don't want to be comfortable with living our worship in neutral. We want to be living our worship in our lives, our marriages, our children's presence, in our neighbor's presence, in gear, engaged fully functional, and aware of our surroundings and aware of our mission in the moment and aware of our motives in our heart. 
Now, this isn't going to be perfectly doable because we're human. But that really doesn't matter because we're told we're made clean and pure by the death, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of who? Jesus. So in our lives, as we go forward, as we make new friends, meet new people, meet people we haven't seen in a while, remember, our lives are living worship, broadcasting an example daily, minute by minute. And when we're alone in our own thoughts, we don't want to go into neutral, but we want to be thinking and meditating on the good things. And good should have a capital G because good refers to those things of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So for us, living our lives of worship, living our times of worship like today, even when it comes down to something as simple as choosing a movie we want to watch, a song we want to listen to, something like that, the purity of our heart and our desire to do that thing with the true and pure and sincere motives of love and worship of and for and to God is important. Our time here right now today is going to be short. I'm almost done here. But the point is, what we have talked about in worship over the last weeks have showed us one of the doctrines that is God, and that is the doctrine of worshiping the Father, the Creator, the Life Giver. Worship is one of the things we are and were made for. Not worship of someone else or something else, but worship of, to, for, and by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So as we go forward in the weeks to come, remember, we're heading into the Easter time, and we're going to be entering into the next doctrine that is God within the next two weeks. And then Easter is going to pop up, and we're going to have some messages on that. But don't forget that worship is one of the showcases of our heart. Just like we publicly acknowledge being bought with a price by Christ's death, just like we acknowledge we want to be buried as the old and born again as the new in baptism, remember, just as we make those public statements, worship in some situations is a public acknowledgement of our Lord, His Son, of all the things that are godly. And so as we live in worship, as we meet our neighbors in worship, as we go to work in worship, remember, everything we do in those times are seen by the Father. They're also felt. Jesus said, whatever you do unto these, the least of them. We know the rest of that. It is for God. And so be mindful of whom we serve and that our worship is not static. What I mean is it doesn't become and stay and never change. As our faith grows, as our belief and our trust, as our devotion grows, so does our worship. It's reflective of what is happening in here and up here. So we are blessed in this little family, as I said earlier. We're blessed to have everything we do, to have been offered so much. For those of you who may not know, this church was handed to this congregation with a quit claim deed and no money. Why would God do that and give us a place with four showers in a basement? 
Why would God put us in the middle of an area where there's 13 other churches within a half mile? Why would God set us up to become who we are in the community and who we are as individuals? Because our worship, when receiving those blessings, will be reflected for the each other, and we belong to each other becomes the manner in which we worship. Now, there's the one another commands in the New Testament. There are a bunch of each other statements. Someday we're going to sit down and go through those and what they actually mean. But remember, we worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but we also worship God through honoring each other, through our actions, through our kindness, through our deeds, through our sharing, through all the things we think. Even the things we think at some point come to a choice and an action. And that is why we need to be close to God, is because everything we meditate and think and focus on at some point comes to an action of choosing to or not to do something. Let's go ahead and close this part of the service. I'm going to go ahead and ask the blessing on the meal, and then we'll enter into our prayer time. Father, thank you for today, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here with my brothers and sisters and to make new friends and to have new opportunities that I never imagined. I know the other family here sees that in themselves as well. And we look at the new and the great things that are coming out of people, and we're thankful for them. And we stand in awe of what you are doing. And so now we also give thanks for the lunch we're going to have, for the time to sit and visit, to be blessed by the abundance we have in our country and even in our church here. We ask that you would let the friends that are here visiting know, and they are invited to. And we thank you again for Jesus, who is not just our elder brother, but also the Lord and Master of our lives. We thank you for the hands that prepared the meal, for the hands that prepared for church today and every week, for those who are behind the scenes doing things. We are so honored to have the people that are behind the scenes helping us here. Their presence is nothing short of a direct gift from you. So in Jesus' holy and righteous name, we ask you to accept our worship and to give honor to our minds and hearts for your benefit so that we can really enjoy and participate and love you as you love us. Amen.